listening to those so you're joining us from from uh, Asia good morning in the US uh, my name is Eric Bergdorf. I'm the director of the LSE Institute of Global Affairs at the School of Public Policy at LSE. You're most welcome to this webinar on do we have the WHO we need, global health governance and reform. This is part of a series on, on COVID-19 and early lessons from the pandemic we are organizing with the CPR and LSE School of Public Policy. So, so last week in this webinar series, we discussed the national governance lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. What could individual countries have done differently? We looked at the national institutions and the need for checks and balances to challenge groupthink and natural tendencies to avoid criticizing authorities during a crisis. But if there's one thing that the pandemic has reminded us is that we need effective global health governance, both as a check on, on national uh, uh, governments, but also to address uh, the global nature of, of the health challenge in the pandemic. Uh, and the fact that we got a pandemic in the first place and that the initial out outbreak turned out into an epidemic that became a pandemic suggests that we could do better. And now with close to 10 million officially infected and 500,000 dead after only five months, we are beginning to understand the scale and scope of the challenge if we don't manage to stop the initial outbreak. So did the WHO do its job? Understandably, WHO has come under some criticism as it has in previous epidemics. Uh, but there's, there was a strong sense that it had learned important lessons from the West African Ebola epidemic five years ago. So what went wrong this time and what do we learn from those mistakes? So one response is that we, the WHO has actually not done all that poorly. Uh, and that we have been much worse off, I think we would agree, that had we not had the WHO. And certainly, when I came across, you know, when I come across the WHO in, in specific settings, whether it's in Yemen or Gaza, or in helping to fight off fake news and disinformation about the pandemic, WHO seems absolutely essential to fight uh, the pandemic. It, it provides invaluable support to national governments, or when national governments cannot deliver to local governments and to and sometimes to individual hospitals and doctors. So you must uh, appreciate what WGO does, but we must also ask ourselves whether we can do better. Another answer to the criticism of WGO is that we, we get the WGO that we deserve. WGO is seriously underfunded. We have undermined its authority to intervene in specific national contexts. We use it to fight political battles that have little to do with global health and that should be fought elsewhere. The recent W or the, the, the recent World Health Assembly provides ample examples of politics coming in the way of effective global health governance in the midst of a pandemic. How, how then can we expect the WHO to deliver on its mission if we don't give it sufficient resources and undermine it by weaponizing it for political purposes? So, so yet in thinking how we can get a better WHO, we, can assume, we cannot assume away politics. We saw from last week's discussion that health and, quest and questions of life and death are deeply political issues. Politicians cannot delegate responsibility to scientific experts or to bureaucrats. One aspect of WHO reform must be about how to strengthen the, its political legitimacy and reassert itself in, in national, its ability to reassert itself in national settings. And, and of course, when it comes to controlling outbreaks of communicative diseases and protecting those most vulnerable where national governments cannot or would not uh, do it. So we have a, a fantastic panel to, to uh, discuss all this. I will introduce them as I speak. Um, we also to bring, want to bring in questions from the audience. Uh, you, you can use the Q&A function in, in, in Zoom and you can use uh, the chat room as well if you want to ask questions. And later on, if you want to come and ask in, in person, uh, we will also uh, bring in people through the raise your hand function. And it, for those of you watching on Facebook, uh, you can use the comments function and we'll try to bring questions uh, to the panel. And, and when asking questions, please introduce yourself with your name and affiliation. But more about this after the presentation. So, so our first speaker 
is um, uh, Rebecca Katz, one of the foremost experts on global health governance. She's a professor of global health at Georgetown University and director of the Center for Global Health Science and Security. Interesting, she, she is also a participant in the initiative for US-China dialogue on global issues, um, which is, a, as I understand, is a faculty research group on, on global health. Um, and, you know, I haven't mentioned China yet by name, but obviously China is an important part of the, of the story. So I'm sure that we'll come back to this. But Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and, and really appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you today. I, I'm going to keep my remarks actually pretty brief because I'm, I'm most interested in, in, the, in the discussion and the dialogue amongst us all. And I, I do want to note that we're, we're having this conversation at a time where um, the United States is actively pulling away from the World Health Organization. And I, I want to state unequivocally that I do not represent the current administration. And while I'm sitting here in Washington, DC, um, I, I in no way, shape or form speak for the government and, and have some, um, some deep concerns about what is happening in terms of that policy. So, so let me say, um, let me say up front, I, I have never shied away from criticizing the World Health Organization. Um, but I do think it's critical to note that the discussion that we're having really needs to be focused on the future and not today. Uh, today, we're clearly in the middle of the greatest public health crisis of the past hundred years. And, and we should be documenting and planning, but not uprooting our institutions right now. But I think to answer the question of the seminar, you know, do we have the World Health Organization that we need? No. Um, they were done. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, the, the first six months of the pandemic have demonstrated the, the challenges of global governance of disease and multilateralism in general. And in fact, the, the failures to consider governance in preparedness has been one of the most significant to effective response to the pandemic. Yet we've also seen the WHO use its capabilities to prevent, detect, respond, coordinate information sharing, counter misinformation, providing clinical and public health expertise, and providing often unneeded warnings to nations about the pandemic, how to respond. And I, I will say up front that I tend to believe that instead of creating new institutions, we really must strengthen the ones we have and give them the tools that they need to succeed. Once we've done that, then we can consider where the gaps remain and how to solve them. And, and to this point, I, I know that Claire has been actively uh, tweeting out these, these messages over the last 24 hours and, and very much look forward to her thoughts on, the, on these issues. But first, let me talk a little bit about resources. The World Health Organization is currently funded at about $2.2 billion a year. Now, this in the scheme of things is a tiny amount of money. Uh, the United States currently has a proposal to set up something they're calling Piper, which is just to, in, to enhance global preparedness in the face of future pandemics, um, which is basically establishing an alternative to the World Health Organization within the United States government. Now, the cost of this endeavor is estimated to be about 2.5 billion. And that is just for the pandemic piece, um, which is more than the entire budget of the World Health Organization, including not only the emergencies program, but also everything else that the WHO does. Now the chronic underfunding of WHO and the challenges associated with the voluntary contributions, making up about 80% of the budget and thus influencing prioritization of activities has certainly created governance challenges and it skews who the actors and drivers are that are setting priorities at the organization. And this raises equity issues as well as just the pure challenges of pursuing activities that the member states expect without the funding to do so. The contingency fund for emergencies was set up to make sure that the WHO wouldn't have to beg for contributions every time they had an outbreak for nat or a natural disaster that required a response. Yet the CFE has um, had contributions totaling 156 million over the last five years and they've allocated 186 million over the last five years. Now, if you're, if you're doing the math in your head, yes, those numbers don't add. Um, so so we're, we're really 
Um, we have a lot of challenges on, on under-resourcing the organization that we're demanding much of. But I think the most relevant thing for this discussion that, that I'd like to bring to the table is the issue of the international health regulations. Now, the IHR are our main governance instrument for health emergencies, and it's imperfect, so much so that it's basically been ignored. And if you allow me, I'd like to just highlight a couple of the, the specific challenges related to the IHR. So first, there, there continues to be debate, and it became quite vigorous during Ebola DRC as to what should define a public health emergency of international concern and whether that definition needs more layers and should there be some type of stoplight function or regional declarations. But to engage in that debate and to really dig in on what should be declared a public health emergency of international concern or not, we need really real information. We need data on, on what a, a FIAC or even a pandemic declaration actually means to governments, to the private sector, to other actors around the world. And what do we expect to happen when a declaration is made? And is that different from what we've already spelled out in our international agreements? And I think there's a lot of um, conjecture, but we, we don't actually have much in terms of empirical data at the moment. Now, the second issue is, is the emergency committee. So um, what is the role of the emergency committee? And this is related and, and whether travel and trade recommendations that are made by an emergency committee are actually adhered to. And what does it mean when most, article, most nations look at Article 43 and kind of shrug their shoulders and move forward with whatever they deem to be in the best interest, interest of their nations, regardless of what it actually means to global governance of the outbreak. And if you don't like what one country has done, the dispute mechanisms that are baked into the IHR, IHR right now are extraordinarily weak. And while we can debate how aggressive the WHO should be in investigating public health emergencies of international concern or even potential FIAX, the negotiating history for the IHR 2005 showed that such powers were debated but never provided to the WHO. And I also think it's become clear that the monitoring and evaluation framework for the IHR, which includes the joint external evaluations and the, the self-reported SPARs, focused on measuring capacity building to prevent, detect, and respond at the national level. And these were either um, measuring the wrong things or measuring the right things the wrong way. And clearly these metrics nor any of the other indices that have been aimed at assessing global health security fully capture the importance of governance. In addition, the IHR focus on country preparedness and failed to address international cooperation and preparedness of multilateral organizations or how to measure that. And finally, there, there, you know, there have been calls for completely renegotiating the IHR, which I, I think makes sense, but they also open up aspects, they may open up aspects of the agreement to discussions that may um, in fact, actually weaken the agreement. And, and that's kind of the, the risk you, ever, you, you always take when you open up the text of, an, a, of a treaty. Another option is to borrow from other international treaties and hold a review conference. And this is to come to common understandings of each article without reopening the text. And this is actually something that we've been arguing for for about four years now um, and, and seems to be getting some, some more legs under it. But even if we look at an entirely new version, uh, negotiating an entirely new version of the agreement, strongly suggests that a RevCon piece is, is baked into that as, as we've learned from, from every other part of international agreements, um, they need care and feeding to stay relevant. And so um, I've either, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's right now, it's an either or. We can't ignore this agreement right now because in its current form, it's, it's not fit for purpose. So we are either looking at completely renegotiating or this kind of intermediate step. Uh, so I think, where does that leave us? I, you know, back, back to the, the main question, the, the WHO is not where it should be right now. It doesn't have the funds it requires to operate effectively, um, including building an integrated data architecture, which I haven't even addressed because it's not really the point of this, this discussion, but something that, um, that very passionate about. And the main governance instruments for disease outbreaks is currently clearly not fit for purpose. And I think all, all of these issues can be addressed 
we can give money, we can build those data architectures, we can even fix the chart, but we also have to admit that there have been significant damage to our global health norms and institutions and specifically to the WHO. And I hope that that's where our, our discussion goes today. So, so with that, let me, let me stop there and I look forward to everybody else's comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. It, it's, unfortunately, this seems, you know, this is a pattern that you come to on many issues of, sort of global governance now that are we going to revisit the whole framework? Are we going to start from, from scratch or, not, or at least, uh, you know, look, look at everything? And, and there are so many other areas like migration or, you know, where you worry that if you start doing that, that you will end up in a, in a much worse place than we are today, even um, not only in terms of the uh, laws on the, on the books or the regulation on the books, but also maybe how it actually works in, in reality. So thank you very much. We will come back to that, I'm sure. The, the next speaker is uh, my colleague from LSE, Professor Matresh Katak. Uh, he's in the economics department at the um, LSE and, and the CPR fellow. He's an original thinker on development and deeply involved in research in many developing countries. So most of you might not associate um, Matresh with the global health research, but um, together with Lucy Gaden, who is speaking later, um, they have written an interesting piece in, in the Vox EU and, and um, on WH reform and coming from the perspective sort of organization theory. And, and, and so we, and we need new ideas. So that's why I wanted to give Matresh the chance to develop his thought and, and, and Lucy. So please, Matresh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Eric, and thanks um, um, fellow panelists uh, for um, um, attending and participating in this discussion, which I very much uh, look forward to learning from um, your uh, discussions as well as the Q&A. So just to um, start with a, a kind of disclaimer that um, the pandemic that we are kind of living through itself has made all of us extremely interested in global public health, even though our own academic and other specializations were not necessarily making us focus on it. You know, its importance was always, you know, as, 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 as large as, as, um, as, as ever. Uh, but uh, somehow, we are almost forced to think about uh, what's happening around us, uh, both the direct public health crisis and the twin economic crisis that all countries developed and developing are going through. And really it's in this spirit that uh, Lucy and I, who have uh, disciplinary um, uh, backgrounds in public economics and development economics, as well as in my case, uh, in the case of organizational economics, we were really trying to think about the architecture of um, this particular organization, the World Health Organization. And in some ways, given that what the experts have been pointing out about what are the uh, political constraints that it faces, the funding constraints that it has, and the timeline of how uh, this particular uh, pandemic broke and how things could have been handled better, et cetera. And again, there's a lot of discussion um, some academics, some in the policy domain, and this is a very lively and, and, and kind of um, large domain in which uh, we, 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 have, uh, we have learned a lot over the last few months, including from our fellow panelists' um, uh, uh, writings. So where we are coming from is, okay, you know, what can we economists, not that we are necessarily, uh, you know, invited to make that comment, but if you self-invited us to this particular forum, then what do we know from the economics of organizations, economic, you know, public economics, in some ways, suppose we think about the conceptual architecture of what a global health organization like the WHO uh, could have been or should have been in terms of how things panned out. Now, at the end of it, we may all end up feeling Panglossian, that maybe it did subject to all the political and funding constraints, it did a fine job or as good a job as it could, or maybe not, there could have been scope for improvement, et cetera. But our point is, suppose we kind of ran a more conceptual exercise as to what is unique about a pandemic and what does a multilateral organization like the WHO, what it could have done in this case um, that that could have been uh, perhaps um, a better response uh, based on what we observe. 
So the first point to uh, note here is that if you think about an organization like the WHO, it's really not, of course, like any other private organization, uh, where in the case of what it's supposed to do and the systems of accountability performance, there is a certain structure of evaluation and kind of um, overall accountability that keeps, um, it keeps uh, track of how things are doing, say, uh, uh, say a private corporation or a large, um, say, aid organization. You can think of various organizations. They don't even have to be, say, for-profit. They could be non-profit. They could, they could be uh, other multilateral organizations. So in the case of the WHO, I think what our first principles thinking from, uh, from the economics of organizations tell us that in dealing with pandemics, what's unique about them? You know, the first thing about pandemics, which makes it kind of, you know, the unique uh, and, and different from many other uh, health issues is what we economists call externalities, but it's, a, of, of, of course, a, you know, very, very uh, widely used concept that otherwise, if it's a matter of improving, say, general health, or if it's a matter of, say, dealing with um, uh, uh, diseases that are not infectious, right? then uh, of course that's important too and there are very solid reasons to believe that left to the, its own devices markets uh, will not allocate uh, resources efficiently here and the case for public action public provision whether it's the nhs uh, type uh, organization here or other health providers clearly there's a room for that but this is a case where the externalities are extreme okay because it's directly infectious so that's number one Number two, if you again think of it from the basic principles of um, economics of organizations, if you think about the constituent countries or all those who are affected by this and whose actions will impact other countries, a pandemic has the feature of what we um, often loosely refer to in economics as a weak link property. It's a bit like any country that is not doing very well in terms of early detection, monitoring, and containment will have a direct impact on others. So even if all the other countries or other regions are doing a fantastic job, the weak link will pull the whole thing down, right? So this is kind of a feature of a pandemic there essentially everybody or every other organization, uh, whether within a country or across, could be doing a fine job. But it's like you can think of this as a team game that, you know, one person's uh, not performing well could actually directly impact everybody else. So that to us is a second feature of a pandemic that has uh, essentially um, uh, some implications for how organizations dealing with them should be, um, uh, should, should be doing. The number third factor is it's a high stake outcome. So as opposed to other infectious diseases, you can think about you know, whether it's, it's, it's a sort of malaria, which uh, directly you know, through, through uh, mosquitoes um, and, 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 and uh, kind of you know, uh, going from one person to the other by those. But in some ways, and they are of course a, a serious health concern for the whole uh, global economy, especially developing countries. But in the case of, uh, of, of, of the uh, uh, COVID-19, I don't need to tell this panel or this audience as to what the stakes are in terms of uh, the potential health outcomes in terms of um, you know, mortality risk and extreme uh, health, health um, uh, uh, negative health, health risks. So if you combine these three, what sort of applying first principles of economics organizations would tell us that having an organization that has a limited budget, which has been pointed out, and a rather diffuse mission, which is general improvement of health at large, right? If you go back to the founding of the WHO, or if you go look at its mission, it is basically improvement of public health, you know, broadly speaking. Now that is of course a laudable general goal and there is, are very solid reasons why it was founded on these principles and which we you know, all, 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 all uh, uh, very, very staunchly believe in. But in the case of the pandemic, what we think that from the point of view of the economics of organization, the combination of a rather broad mission as well as having limited budget would essentially given the particular features of pandemic would Indeed, even if we ran this experiment conceptually, as opposed to uh, look at the history of how things panned out, 
you would predict an outcome like that. Now, essentially what this means is that having a particular division of the WHO that you know, completely is focused on, on, on pandemics and their early detection, monitoring, and containment, that is uh, going to be key. Now, I and Lucy will, of course, speak uh, when her, uh, in, her, in, a, in a slot. We are agnostic. We do support the WHO, and we, it's not a matter of essentially uh, starting everything afresh. But the broad points we want to make is we need to have clarity as to like, for example, that happened with the 9-11 uh, and airline security across the world, that suddenly something that was potentially high impact and again, potentially subject to this weak link problem, everybody raised their game in terms of how to heighten or have uh, compatibility and, and, and cooperation in security standards. And while this, the problem has not gone away, but we have certainly raised up to the challenge and have done better than when uh, that particular uh, thing broke. So here, I would say uh, the core things that we, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in this essay that we wrote, uh, we wanted to focus on is having at least a division of the WHO that is narrowly focused on pandemic control. And number two, of course, the funding. Now, the funding and the politics of US versus China and all of this that we are hearing, they're not disconnected. If your funding depends on direct contribution of countries, of course, those who give more will have more say. And then whatever is happening in the architecture of international relations will have a direct shadow on, you know, the shadow fights here would mimic what the broader, uh, you know, international relations are playing out. So we've got to have to find a way of a funding uh, method that could partly insulate the WHO or this division of the WHO from this power politics that uh, will, uh, you know, happening right now and will continue to happen in the international arena. So I will, um, uh, I will uh, wrap up my uh, part of the discussion and uh, because um, uh, Lucy will uh, specifically talk about uh, the funding issue and also the kind of sanctions and monitoring technology that the WHO or this division of the WHO should have to do a better job. But once again, these are, you could say, blue sky thinking, and we, of course, uh, would are very keen to have a dialogue with the uh, um, global health experts, and hopefully we can learn a bit from uh, this discussion from the back and forth. Thank you very much, uh, Matresh. So without further ado, uh, our next panelist is uh, Lucy Gaden. She is the uh, assistant professor at the economics department at Warwick and the CPR affiliate. Normally she works on public economics, uh, particularly in developing countries. Uh, Lucy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Eric, and thanks uh, to both Rebecca and Matrix for these really uh, interesting contributions. I think I'm gonna build on both of those, which is, I guess, ideally what you want from a panel. So as, as Matrix explained, with him and I have been uh, thinking a lot recently at how, what's the future of the WHO? And uh, so he's explained, you know, we think we need to, WHO needs to refocus its mission on um, uh, pandemic prevention. But then we decided to spend some time looking into the tools uh, that the WHO has and whether these tools are adequate uh, to fulfill its mission. And we think these tools are grossly inadequate on two fronts. The first is its enforce the WHO's enforcement capacity, and the second is just the money. So Rebecca mentioned already both of these two. Um, I'm gonna build a little bit on what she said. Just in terms of the enforcement capacity, the WHO simply does not have the capacity to sanction member states when they don't follow its rules. That means it's going to be hard to be taken seriously. Right? It also means that the WHO has to spend a lot of time and energy trying to sweet talk countries into doing the right thing, as we've seen to a certain extent with China in January and February. And one thing to highlight is that there are other international institutions that do have capacity to sanction member states when they don't follow the rules. An interesting comparison that at least speaks a lot to economists is the comparison with the World Trade Organization that does have a sanctioning power. So clearly as a global community, we've decided global trade is important enough that we think we should sanction countries that don't follow rules that abide by global trade rules. You know, global public health is at least as important as global, as global trade, so why not have, and uh, why not give the WHO a capacity uh, to sanction countries? 
So Rebecca has mentioned the international health regulations, which are the existing framework that sets rules that countries are supposed to abide by to avoid the global spread of diseases. The things about the AHRs, as she's mentioned quickly, you know, is there's just no, not much capacity for the WHO to enforce them. So one of the rules set out in the AHR is that a country in which a new disease is spreading has to notify the WHO within 24 hours. But if a country doesn't do that, the WHO can't do anything about it. It's even worse than that. If the WHO has reasons to believe that a new disease is spreading somewhere, say, for example, in China, because it has communications from non-state actors in China, the WHO does not have the capacity to just send people on the ground to investigate what's happening. It's just not allowed to do this. So a good place to start would be to rethink these IHRs, as Rebecca has mentioned, to at least give the WHO the capacity to send inspectors, officials, experts on countries, on fact-finding missions to check the sanitary situations there. Once again, there's a comparison to be made here with what the UN does for weapons, right? There are weapons inspectors, especially on nuclear proliferation, that, you know, that the UN sends in countries to check what's happening um, in terms of nuclear proliferation. Again, why doesn't the WHO have similar powers? So we think you know, that the WHO should have more sanctioning powers. The WHO is quite good at setting international standards. For example, what are the standards that all countries should follow to try to prevent uh, the, the, the spread of new uh, epidemic diseases? So having bigger sanctions will give countries more incentives to abide by these standards, but it's probably not going to be enough, especially for the poorest countries they're also going to need WHO to provide with financial and technical assistance, which brings me to the money, which is, you know, the other big uh, tool that WHO has, which is currently completely inadequate. So I think there's clearly already a consensus on the panel that um, the WHO doesn't have enough money. We've talked about, you know, two to three billion annual budgets. Just how little is this? Well, it's about the same as the budget of the big hospital in Geneva, so where the WHO is located. So it seems absolutely ludicrous to think we're going to prevent future pandemics with the budget that's equivalent to the budget of a big hospital, even a big, rich Swiss hospital. So it's clearly not enough. I think we need to have a public debate to say how much more is needed. That's not for economists to say, but it clearly has to be orders of magnitude higher. Where economists can have something useful to bring to the table is, you know, think about, okay, where could the money come from? What form of funding should the WHO have? Both um, Rebecca and Matrix have mentioned the fact that most of the WHO spending comes from what's called voluntary contributions. These are basically amounts of money that countries or non-state donors can choose whether or not to contribute to the WHO budget. And 80% of the budget comes from those. Obviously, this means that the WHO is in a very vulnerable position. It means it has to advise, monitor, potentially sanction countries like China and the US, but at the same time, China and the US are the ones deciding whether it's going to have enough money to function next year. It also means from a governance and accountability perspective, WHO is potentially more accountable to its big donors than to the World Health Assembly, where one country has one vote, and that's another problem. So what Matrix and I have suggested in our piece is that the WHO needs its own source of funding that doesn't have to renegotiate every other year with every single member country. So there's tons of potentially, uh, potentially interesting sources of funding for the WHO. What we suggest that maybe you want uh, to make contribute those that benefit the most from the kind of things the WHO is doing. So what, what happened when COVID hit, the first economic uh, effect of um, COVID was the shutdown of global trade and international air travel. So clearly, people who benefit from global trade and international travel have a lot to lose there. So maybe we want them to contribute a lot uh, to the WHO's budget. We can think of a levy on international tra air travel that's been done before to fund other global health funds. So it's not a completely new proposition. We can also think about you know, having a levy on multinational corporations. Why multinational corporations? Well, they benefit a lot. They make a lot of money from being able to operate internationally. They also currently do not quite pay their fair share to global uh, national public budgets because um, a lot of their profits are booked in tax havens and they pay little taxes on that. So maybe these are the actors, you know, if they're not contributing to national public budgets, they should be contributing to international public budgets, such as the WHO's. 
Finally, quickly, we want to put on the table up for debate the possibility that the WHO should have the capacity to borrow. Clearly, there's going to be some times where the WHO needs to act a lot now, including you know when there's a pandemic, so it needs to mobilize funds really fast. We don't want the WHO to have to go back to each country when a pandemic hits to give it more money, because uh, countries at that moment also need more money. So enabling it to have the capacity to borrow, potentially from places like the World Bank or the IMF, would be an interesting proposition. And I'm going to end there. Last but not least, uh, Claire Wenham, also a colleague of mine at the LSE. She's an assistant professor in global health policy, and she's director of the MSC in global health policy at the LSE. She works mostly in the crossover between global health and international relations, focusing on global health, security, and global governance. And she's worked extensively on other global health crises like Ebola and Zika. So, Claire, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Eric, and thanks to Rebecca, Matrasha, and Lucy for your comments. It was so interesting this afternoon. So, um, I'm going to let's play a bit of devil's advocate uh, to what's been put before us so far this afternoon because it's, you know, middle of the afternoon, people need to be kept awake. But I think the first thing we need to talk about is there's three fundamental things you need to know about the World Health Organization, right? One is the politics, one is its So let me elaborate. First of all, and probably most importantly for all the discussions we're having, we can't forget that the World Health Organization is a member state organization, right? The way it, is, the way it runs is through decisions made by member states. The way it gets money is through decisions made by member states. The things it prioritizes is through decisions made by member states. And so talking about the World Health Organization as if it's a completely independent body, which isn't driven by member state decision making, is a little bit, you need, you need, we need to nuance it a bit more, right? Because actually we need to think about states and why states aren't giving WHO the power uh, and decision making ability and funding to be able to do things. So that's the, that's the position. With the politics, well, the WHO has always been played by politics, right, at every level of activity, whether it's deciding which, which issues to go on the World Health Assembly agenda, what issues are going to get funded, which issues aren't going to get funded, political decisions. And there have been calls previously to try and separate the kind of politic, political arm and the technical arm of the World Health Organization. And fundamentally, I don't think these are possible because every decision you make is going to be political in some way, depending on what evidence you listen to, what approach you decide is most important. These are all political decisions. There's also politics within the organization as well, between different levels of governance. So the World Health Organization is a sort of three-tier system with a kind of secretariat, the regional offices, and country offices, and there's different decisions and politics happening there as well. And then the th third key issue is this issue of funding, which, which um, my other colleagues have touched on, that the funding mechanism is fundamentally flawed. When you've got an organization which, A, doesn't have enough money, but also doesn't have control of its budgets because 80% of its budget is decided by external institutions that get to pick which issues they think are important and put money through the voluntary contributions mechanism uh, to, to fund that. Now that's based on government election cycles, what they need to be able to demonstrate. They normally focus on issues which align with their development agendas, for example. And then really what WHO per se might prioritize. But I think when we come to them thinking about now, right? So these, that's the kind of key, you know, 101 WHO introduction of what you need to know about, about the WHO's political uh, practice. But when you come to now and you're thinking about this question that was asked today, which is, you know, do we have the WHO we want? Well, no, we don't, right? And we clearly don't because it's limited by its states, because it's limited by its funding structure, because it's limited by internal, dis internal tensions in, in any big organization, right? But I'm not sure that we have all the answers. And I also don't think we should necessarily be holding WHO to be the one who's to blame for all of this. We need to make sure we include the role of states and state failures not to make WHO what it could be. The idea about the World Health Organization when it was set up was to have the, to achieve the highest attainable standard of health for all peoples, regardless of who they are. Now, if that's its, its ethos, we should be, and if we think that's important and we as a global society value and recognize health, we should money, effort, power to this organization. 
But that's not the organization's problem per se, but it's a broader question around governance and why aren't states as the, as in our Westphalian system giving more power and money to the health organization. And I want to talk to the three points that was made, were made by Mitresh and Lucy in their, their article. Right, so the first one is around the narrow focus. Now, again, this has been suggested before, you know, why do, could, can the World Health Organization, given all its structural constraints, given its financial constraints, should it be able to do everything, right? And is, it, would it be a, a, a better approach or a more, more um, productive approach to focus on what it's good at, right? Focus on infectious disease control, right? And all the other things can be done by the market, for example, or by other actors. The risk of that is that those other things don't happen. Right, and that raises serious equity concerns. Right, some some things aren't sexy for funders in the same way that outbreaks are. Right, people don't care about diarrheal disease. People don't care about um, you know chronic illness in the same way they do about outbreaks. And so we're funded. Right, and these things do kill as many people as outbreaks. Right, just we're talking about outbreaks now. It's because we're in one. But actually, the the longer term uh, the longer term illnesses, the mortality and morbidity burdens are higher amongst other things as well. You've only got to look at um, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa to see that as many women died of obstetric complications in 2014, people died of Ebola in 2014, right? So you've really got to ask, ask, ask questions about equity, about why do we think we should focus on this narrow, this narrow infectious disease control program. But I'd also add that, you know, we did learn from Ebola and the WHO did then create an institution or, or a subsection, um, a program within its, within, within its organization to respond just to outbreaks, which was the health emergencies program. And the idea of this was that it was going to be an operational capacity to the World Health Organization to respond to outbreaks that it didn't previously have. One of the mistakes that came out of the 2014 Ebola outbreak was that the World Health Organization wasn't doing what governments thought it should be doing. And there's a fundamental tension there, which is, as, as, as colleagues have said, it's a technical body, right? It's a technical organization that provides guidance. It's not there with a standing army to, to go in and respond to these outbreaks. But it listened to its member states, and it did then develop its own health emergencies program to be able to do that. But again, it suffers from chronic underfunding. The second point about sanctions is also something that's been debated in the literature for a long time around global health security, right? And, and linking to what Rebecca was talking about, the international health regulations. One of the key tensions with this framework is its enforceability, right? You can ask states to build core capacities to ensure that they are prepared and are able to respond to crisis, but how are you gonna be able to do it, right? There's no allocation of financing with, with, with the um, IHR requirements. There's no allocation of responsibility. Uh, and so it's up to member states to do it. And as Matresh pointed out, you know, this is a global collective problem where any one state which doesn't do it poses a risk to the rest of the world. And so this is a real issue, right? And it's this kind of, can you, uh, and, and, and a lot of the debate that was happening a decade ago about the international health regulations was around this kind of, is naming and shaming governments for failure to comply enough, right? And there were conversations about, can we link this to some sort of sanction? But this then goes back to that same question of position, right, that I kind of started with. This is a member state organization and the member state, to, for a sanction to be included in the international health regulations, it would need to be approved by member states, right, at the World Health Assembly. Member states aren't going to sign up to be sanctioned, right? They're just not going to do it. Uh, I'm not an expert in World Trade Organization history and how they managed to uh, get sanctions put in WTO. I just can't see a place where, where that happens, um, particularly not in the current climate where we see states going it alone uh, in responding to the coronavirus outbreak and not listening to global norms. I can't see why they would start, start doing that now. But where I, um, where I completely agree though with, with your suggestions is the budget, right? And I think this is something that everybody who works on World Health Organization uh, policy, global health policy, is that the funding is completely inadequate, right? Both the structure of funding and the volume of funding is completely inadequate for what we want the World Health Organization to do. And so I think if we, you know, we really need to consider that, right? There's not enough money, fundamentally. How do we get more money into the system? Well, one option would be to get governments to pay more, but I can't see that happening either, right? We're about to go into a massive global recession. They're not gonna have more money to pay. 
uh, the, you know, the, the amount they pay is linked to their GDP, and if GDP falls, it's, it's going to fall uh, in terms of the contributions they pay as well. And so then there's this question of can we leverage private sector money into the World Health Organization, which ultimately I think we're going to have to. But I think we have to think about how we do that carefully. And I say that because the world, uh, the world experimented with bringing private sector money into health emergencies after the Ebola outbreak through the World Bank's development of the Pandemic Emergency Financing Facility. And that's widely seen to be a massive fail, right? It wasn't able to deploy. It was based on parametric criteria of the insurance industry, which were too high to actually respond to a pandemic. And the whole point of pandemic um, preparedness and interventions is you want to respond early, right? You want to get in there early to uh, make sure the outbreak doesn't become a pandemic. But the way the, the pandemic emergency financing facility was written was that it only going to pay out once it gets to be a certain level, which completely defies the point. And so I think we need to think about other ways of financing the WHO and trying to get money into it. You know, the suggestion, the modeling on the UNITAID suggestion of, of leveraging money from the airline industry might be one thing, but the airline industry is, you know, teetering on the brink of collapse. So is there going to be any money there, right? So how else can we use the private sector? One um, approach that I think has been quite interesting is looking at the AXA model of reassurance in France, which uses a certain amount of the insurance premiums that are paid each year to put into contingency building, right? So instead of keeping it as a private sector, that then gets put into how do we build capacity to limit flood damage? How do we build capacity to limit these natural concerns? And so can we somehow work with the insurance industry to try and get some of the money that they're now losing through business continuity uh, upheaval, for example, and put that into financing capacity building for outbreaks. But again, that's going to raise questions. Bringing in the private sector into the World Health Organization is going to raise bigger political questions. There's been a lot of concern around, you know, the involvement of non-state actors in a member state organization. It's, that's been leveraged at, um, you know, the, from the Gates Foundation all the way through to the involvement of the alcohol sector and, you know, Heineken's involvement in the World Health Organization. But, you know, people are nervous about the private sector in a multilateral organization. So I think it has to be, you know, done gently. But finally, even if we had money and we could build capacity into the system to be able to mitigate against future outbreaks, I think the thing that we're not thinking about is polit the politics of this, right? And that, that actually capacity is not enough, right? If you look at the two countries that the Global Health Security Index rated as the most able to respond to outbreaks in uh, 2019, it was the US and the UK, right? And that was based on criteria used to measure capacity to respond and policy to respond. It's not enough. And I think it's not enough because it doesn't account for politicians making decisions which aren't, you know, it's a, it's a technoc technocratic instrument that doesn't and so we need to ensure that we can somehow account for politics in how we're looking at how, how countries will respond to outbreaks, right? Because that's not measurable in, in instrument terms, but it needs to be measurable because that is what's dictating this coronavirus. So I will leave that here, um, but I really look forward to our conversations. Thank you, Claire. I think that was a, a very good uh, provocative ending to, to the, the, the first presentation. So I, I'm actually going to go directly to uh, bring in something that came up uh, from the audience and you all of you touched on it. So, but, but uh, there's from Daniel Otelenghi, he says, how, how likely is the international consensus to give WHO enforcement powers? Isn't the current political climate of asserting nationalism a major obstacle? And, and to just develop that a little bit. So, so you all mentioned the issues of, of um, you know, it's a member state organization and, and member states, it seems in the health space are particularly um, concerned about giving up um, uh, sovereignty. And we see the same thing in the European Union that there's very few um, powers of, of the EU when it comes to, to uh, healthcare. And, and, um, but, but that, on the one hand, and on the other hand, as, as many of you have emphasized, it's a global challenge, it's a global public good. It's actually a, a number of different uh, public goods. It spoke about sort of the, the fighting the pandemic as such, but of course there are also other public goods involved in, in, in responding to a, to a pandemic. So 
how how do you see this? Um, what what is the chance that member states actually will truly uh, delegate um, or, or give up sovereignty over decisions about health and 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 and, and life and, and and death? Maybe Rebecca, can you start on this? Yeah, I, I guess I. Um... I'm pausing because I, I think it might be worth reframing that a little bit. Okay. I'm not okay. sure this is, I think that, what are we actually asking of the member states specifically? Is it, how, what, what are they giving up? Um, and I think, I mean, let me go, let me go back to, you know, Lucy discussed investigations and you know, what, what we have seen in other international agreements and, you know, what IAEA is allowed to do in terms of being able to go in and do, ins um, you know, and, and, and do inspections. Um, let me, let me actually just first note that um, that hasn't actually worked in the bio space. And in fact, the UN, UNSGM, the UN Secretary General's Mechanism for Investigating Allegations of Alleged Chemical and Biological Weapons Use, who, um, uh, has, has been played from day one on, on the challenges of states have to allow we 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 don't tend to invade countries to um investigate outbreaks even even though those that we consider that might be deliberate and so that has never that we've never actually had success in the bio front on um it, it, it in any other international forum mm -hmm. uh so i think that can that and in fact even in the united states um the cdc can't invade Connecticut to investigate an outbreak of um, foodborne illness without their permission. So I think there, you know, we, we continue to have have challenges in this. I think the the that we have seen moments in time where the member states and to Claire's point come together and and decide that they actually think that this is something that is important and useful and and will help all populations in population health and they're willing to see some of their national sovereignty in order to do that um and and we we got really far actually in the in the negotiations for the 2005 version of the ihr mm -hmm. uh and this was so post sars um the the member states came close and in, in looking at like the earlier iterations not the final draft but earlier iterations of the agreement actually allowed for the types of investigations you're talking about and and this and the and the, the movement towards these member states actually agreeing that this was something that was important and needed to happen so so i i i don't know i'm i'm struggling eric with how to answer your question because I, I i i'm trying i'm looking at at what we've been through where we're going and um and I think I think it is doable, but it's only doable if you have an organization that you trust to be effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then that brings up all of the issues that Claire just raised mm -hmm. around the the, mm -hmm. the politics of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, but I will let, let me also just really quick take the moment since I, I have the floor. I think mm -hmm. to um, the the points um, and Matresh's point about the 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 need for kind of the an emergency uh, you know an, an investigative group that actually is kind of what the emergency program is and um i you know there, there's lots of discussion and debates right now proposals for how to how to change that program but but we actually already have that structure in place so now they who has never had and then some of this is public perception. If you read novels, you'll see, you know, you'll, you'll read sections where, you know, and then the WHO comes in in paramilitary form and in uniforms and doesn't invest, you know, they're, they're jumping out of airplanes. It's like that, that's not the organization. Mm -hmm. That's not what they really ever have been. If that's what we want them to be, then they're going to have to be staffed and, and given the authorities to operate mm -hmm. like that. But I think there, there continues to be a bit of a disconnect here between what mm. they are, what the mm. member states have empowered them already to do, mm. and, and where, where we imagine they might mm. be. So, so anyway, but sorry, I didn't really Thank answer you. your question. Well, no, you, you did in, 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 in a roundabout way.
But but uh, the anyone else wants to come in on this question? I had, otherwise have a maybe. Can I let the, I invited uh, George Papa Constantinou to, to um, ask the question? Can I, um, George? Can I maybe introduce yourself and and uh, ask a question? A, a lot of the. Um... First of all, can you, for, can you introduce yourself? Sorry, George. Sorry, George Papa Constantino, I'm a professor at the European University Institute and a former finance minister in, in Greece. Uh, a lot of the um, presentations focused on the political aspects uh, of uh, the difficulty of reform in WHO. So I wanted to, to prod you a little bit on that one. Um, I mean, the elephant in the room is, is of course, the current US administration. Um, but of course, China could also be a, a big obstacle to WHO reform. We've seen China going back and forth, back and forth in terms of, of how we treated the WHO, depending on how the WHO reported from China. So the question is, do you think that post, you know, let, let's, let's go a few months ahead and post uh, November elections with a different US administration, do you think that some of the elements that you have all considered as a no-go areas could potentially change or because if, if if we don't think that way in other words if we don't think that there will be any movement on supporting multilateral institutions such as the who then 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 perhaps a lot of the discussion we're having is is not leading anywhere i think you know that is a bit also where um Rebecca's comment ended in a way, you know, that was her response to my previous question, you know, that, you know, in order to, for member states to give up control, they need to trust the organizations. And, and if, if anyone wants to comment on what uh, George's question. So thank you. Thank you for that question. It's, it's really important, right, that it, we shouldn't just be naysayers and should think productively about how to move this forward. And I agree that it depends on, you know, who's in the room and a different US administration might be more proactive and more, more favorable towards multilateral institutions as they have been historically. I mean, let's not forget that the US has been the driving force of the creation of the uh, World Health Organization initially and then the creation of the international health regulations and the revision of the international health regulations. You know, these were heavily driven by US belief in global health security, US belief in uh, you know, global public goods and um, and pushing this agenda forward at the World Health Organization. But I also don't think we can think about it in binary terms. You know, the, the, a lot of the conversation at the moment at the WHO uh, around the WHO is this kind of proxy battle between and and the US. But the WHO is a member state organization of 194 members, right? It's not just two. And yes, they are the most the the, the biggest. Yes, they are. But we shouldn't underestimate the role of other countries in this, right? Particularly around infectious disease control, we see a big role for Scandinavian states, for Australia, for Canada, and they can drive things as well. I also don't think we can underestimate the power of having an African Director General of the World Health Organization is in inspiring other governments to get more active and push against the status quo and try and change the organization from being a kind of US-led entity into a much more inclusive and representative organization. I think we're seeing that change occurring. Um, and so I think we kind of, we can, can move away from thinking about it as just a kind of US led question. However, uh, so, so I, when I, I teach kind of governance of World Health Organization every year to my students. And when I do that, we always have a session on WHO reform and you know, how can we do better and what, what can we do better? And the students always, you know, start off by pulling the house down and saying, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, we should start again. And then when I get them to, okay, think, what would you, what would you do in a, if, it, if, it, if we got rid of the WHO, if you burnt down the house and started again, what would you have? And they have done, you know, every year, basically create the World Health Organization again, right? They want it to be inclusive. They want everyone to have a vote. They want it to be limited, not limited by money. They want it to cover all health issues. And so, you know, fundamentally, this is what we need. We just need governments to, you know, embrace internationalization and embrace multilateralism and embrace global governance. And so I think actually the conversation shouldn't be at the World Health Organization, but needs to be in national governments, right? Why are we not trusting more in this organization, which is, yeah. is there to perform this function and that we have 
you know, potential to invest in and make it a really strong organization. Sorry, Eric, can I? Yeah, make... sure, sure. So actually my comments are more in reaction to some of Claire's earlier comments and also what uh, she just said. Uh, you know, and let me start with the caveat that uh, uh, I probably would have failed her course given uh, what she told, uh, what her students write up every time in terms of how to redesign the WHO and then they design exactly what we see now, which to me is a very Panglossian kind of, you know, approach in terms of what we see out there is the best of all possible worlds in a highly imperfect world. And that's, a, you know, that's a, you know, uh, you know I, I respect that position. I don't happen to agree with it. Um, so in some ways, what actually we were trying to do, and again, with the due caveat of coming here as outsiders to the uh, uh, you know, field of uh, global public health and really motivated about what went wrong when like one of the biggest crises really hit, hit us and has affected each of us and, and the global economy uh, as well as our lives at large. And again, it's in the spirit of you know, blue sky thinking and back and forth. So therefore, my comments are very much in that spirit. So where I was puzzled by some of uh, Claire's points, and let me sort of therefore, uh, uh, you know, mention them because otherwise we'll, uh, uh, you know, we should be on the same page. So you, you know, one of the things you said that it's a member state based organization and therefore how will you sanction all of this? So maybe therefore that is a problem. So yes, the existing structure is a member state based organization and yet we outline what the core problem of handling a pandemic is. If you're saying that, look, it's like something is on the hill and this car cannot you know, really go up the hill, then maybe we need a, another vehicle. Maybe it's something that could come out of this you know, master vehicle, or we need to come up with another more flexible vehicle that could go up to that, that particular terrain. So that's sort of comment number one. Yes, I understand the constraint that these are member state organizations. And similarly, I would say number two, I'm always a little kind of puzzled by this perspective that, hey, even if this pandemic didn't happen, there are other global health problems which cause mortality, especially in developing countries where poverty and comorbidity uh, cause, you know, like uh, some of the things uh, uh, you mentioned about, uh, about Ebola and at that time, the kind of uh, deaths during maternity, et cetera. But the problem is that that argument in some ways, anytime you have a global and general crisis, that's very, it's a, it's a bit like during the financial crisis, we could say, hey, there are booms and busts, they keep on happening. So, okay, you know, financial crisis happened. So what, are, you know, maybe our existing institutions are fine to deal with it because booms and busts are intrinsic and why focus on this particular thing? Again, this analogy may not be exact and I'm really thinking aloud here. So my problem is exactly that's why we came up with this airlines, you know, the terrorism and the airlines uh, security example that, hey, let's set aside the problem that in the 6 billion population in the whole world, two thirds or more live under abject poverty. And as a developing economist in the courses I teach, uh, you know, my students are asked to exactly answer what are the development policies you can come up with. So we are not exactly outsiders to the problem of malnutrition, of the various other kinds of diseases and, and, and so on. And indeed, the last year's economics Nobel Prize, you know, among some of the people who, uh, you know, who it was in the field of development economics, they're pretty much focused on their work on health and education and other things. So my problem is, hey, you have a particular problem that's hitting you. Now, should we let the kind of perfect health organization, global health organization that will deal with all aspect of health and have this very inspiring goal of better health for every person, which we are all signed up for. And none of us, at least I can certainly speak for again, nobody's advocating a market-based approach here. You know, anybody familiar with my work would, um, uh, would, uh, would uh, and, and, and some of the uh, arguments we make is clearly there are market failures and you know we can we can have partnerships so my problem is okay if it's a member state bit organization and that is causing a constraint maybe we should remove the constraint we should think flexibly think of maybe another division where that constraint is not there right and similarly if we always say that hey there is always other diseases and other ways in which people are dying 
uh, that does make us a little bit, you know, okay, so, you know, this is a particular form of, uh, of a health crisis. And what is a silent crisis that, again, I'm sure everybody here is aware of, is the problem of hunger and starvation in developing countries that are already, I just did a piece on India, where already the non-COVID related deaths have now reached, it's, uh, you know, about a thousand. And this is, again, a conservative estimate, where, which is, and the overall COVID related deaths are about 15k so this is basically starvation displacement and and hunger and all of these things so anyway so again i i, I very much um uh, you know respect the political consensus it's not like what we are saying we'll still have to somehow go to the member countries so we are we, we are aware of that problem but anyway i i think i have um, i've said enough and i'll, I'll let them uh, step in okay th thanks mitresh so, you know just a, a reflection on, on my side you know so having worked in one of these member state organizations, you know, they're very different. And, and some of them, you know, the, um, the management or the, uh, the leadership has a lot of uh, autonomy and, and actually drive a lot of the agenda. And so there's a question here in, in the, um, among, from the audience and Rai Kumar here. And so, so he asked about the, the World Health Assembly. And of course, that's something that is different from uh, many of the organizations that, that I'm familiar with, you know, so he says, I never understand the mechanism of the WHA, so the World Health uh, Assembly. It, what is their mechanism to take decisions? And, and in reality, there's a little de deliberation to what is presented by the Secretariat when even resolutions already drafted for rubber stamping uh, come to the WHA. So how should I think of WHA for those who are not completely familiar with the how, how the way the WHO operates. Maybe uh, Rebecca, you can. Well, I was going to throw that one to Claire. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to throw it back to you. Um, so the World Health Assembly is the governance body which makes the decisions about what the World Health Organization is going to do. So if you think of the World Health Organization as the kind of, you know, the Tedros and, and his team, uh, in Geneva, that's the Secretariat, and they are empowered to follow an agenda which is decided by the um, uh, World Health Assembly on an annual basis, right, which is made up of representatives of each country. And so just like any political trade-off in any political forum and, and sort of parliamentary forum, right, you have um, agendas put to the table in advance that are discussed and debated, and you have, um, you know, corridor conversations and pressure put on different people in different places in advance to get resolutions through and get get things approved or not approved you know we saw this so acutely this this time around with the uh with all the stuff around coronavirus and the investigation and around access to vaccines and stuff and you know it's it's just like any other parliamentary governance process in that way right and then what's decided there then gets implemented at the secretariat level so they're deciding, you know, uh, in a, and the whole idea of it is to try and get away from the most dominant countries having uh, more sway by having it as uh, one vote per country, right? And all of equal weighting. Now, obviously, we don't know what happens behind closed doors and how much, you know, we can all imagine uh, that people are going to listen to uh, their donor countries uh, and, you know, vote according to other demands put on them. But the idea is it's supposed to be equitable, right? The, the problem that comes into that then is who, who doesn't get a vote, right? And who doesn't get a vote is people like the Gates Foundation, right? Even though they're the biggest funder, right? And so should we try and make the World Health Organization more inclusive or should we try and keep it as a state-based approach? And actually, um, actually Mitresha, I, I kind of agree with what you're saying um, that maybe, maybe you need the big crisis moment to expose the flaws, right? in a state-based global system, I don't know how you get, you go beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I would be in favor of, of thinking of new models, but I just don't, I just don't see how we get to the point where states are willing to cede that power that they have, right? At the moment, they're the ones who decide. Um, and I would love to see more civil society organizations, right? More uh, people working in this space involved. Uh, you know, they can, be, they can be observers at the moment, but to be able to have decision-making power would be great. Uh, and, you know, look to more innovative mechanisms of, of managing outbreaks. I think it would be amazing. Mm. I just can't see how it happens. 
And one thing you could say, is, which I think is so interesting about the WHA, is, is exactly what you emphasize, that every state has one vote, which is very different from, for example, the World Bank or, or, or any regional development bank where, you know, where you are actually voting compared, you know, relative to your capital contribution. You know, this is, again, going back to that health and, you know, decisions about life and death uh, are, are different in a way. And, 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 you know, that's, I think, what the WHA in some way um, reflects. Uh, but, but I think that the point, yeah. Claire's point, though, is there's, there's the voting in WHA. There's who mm -hmm. is rotating through on the executive board that helps set mm -hmm. that agenda. Yeah. Um, and then, and then there's the, the fact that, as we've been discussing, 80% of the budget is mm. from non-assessed contributions. Mm. And so that, you know, you can, you can have those conversations, but the, yeah. the, the work itself is being, mm. the priorities are being set in some ways by the budget and not necessarily by the voting. So that's a, a question which I think is, is uh, you know, something is on, on a lot of people's minds is, is the, the proliferation of, of fake news and, and infodemic, you know, WHO has talked about the infodemic, uh, you know, there is a, there seems to be a very strong interest from all of us to have, you know, an, an entity that uh, can address it. So is Willy Baldo Saavedra, who is asking, how can uh, the WHO deal with the major proliferation of fake news during the pandemic? Um, and, and of course, uh, considering the new ways people are communicating on the social media. So, so Rebecca, you wanted to come I in on that. Very quickly. And I think this is, um, right, there, there, is, there, is, there is the infodemic that has mm. happened. Um, and I think this is actually one of, the, one of the areas where an organization like WHO, and in this mm. respect, the WHO, is is doing a really a, as as strong of a job as I think they possibly can at this point. Um, I think one of the challenges in an outbreak in any public health event is risk communication, crisis communication, um, and having a, a a trustworthy entity that mm -hmm. gets up every day in front of the mm -hmm. press, describes what they know, um, and 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 to their credit, every single day of this outbreak. Dr. Tedros, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Van Kirkhoff have sat in front of news cameras and given updates and answered questions. And sometimes those questions are very repetitive. Um, we have, we have, uh, we, we get notes from the events, and, and the note takers are like, oh, they asked this question again. Um, but they, but they've done that in a way that many governments have not. And I, I will say, you know, the United States government has not. And. They, I think they are, they are active and from very early days of the pandemic were um, set up an entire system around the trying to counter the um, incorrect information. Mm. And so I think that they have, um, are they perfect on this? No, absolutely not. Mm. Um, but, but I think that, the, I think part of the idea of having um, I, like the evidence beacon on the hill is that that there is an evidence-based beacon mm. on the hill that mm. one can go to to say you know yeah there's all this noise out there mm. tell, tell us what's right and now sometimes you know I, I think many of us might get frustrated because of their um the process they go through to validate the fact that their data are always um a bit behind everyone else's mm. um which again that's back to that integrated data architecture um, and and the, the carefulness by which they try to validate information, which is sometimes um, not as helpful in a mm. rapidly evolving situation. Mm. But we can all still turn to it and says, yes, but WHO says. Mm. And I think that this is, this is, the, this is where having an organization, this is where the, the comments, you know, Claire said, if you didn't have it, you'd have to, you'd have to develop it. Um, that, that this is one of the critical roles that they've served during the outbreak. Okay, I'll stop. Can I, there's a question here from Charles Enoch and, and it sort of reveals my own ignorance too. So he says, is there a role for generic global and regional organizations? So I guess uh, the part that I want to pick up here is the, the regional organizations. But 
you know, in, we have regional development banks, and some of them are involved in, in health, but not in a very serious way. It, it's really, really very much the World Bank uh, sort of territory. Uh, as I spoke about the European Union not having a lot of uh, authority when it comes to health. Other, other parts of, of the world where you have powerful regional organizations. I'll, I'll jump in very quickly on this, but <laughs> yeah. I think it's important for, for folks who haven't spent a lot of time in this space before, it's important to note that the, the WHO actually has seven different regional offices. And yes. so, and, and those regions are, you know, I, I, so the, there are the regional offices of WHO. There's also the country offices of WHO. Um, and then on top of that, we also have seen um, uh, regional, other regional entities that have formed, uh, that, that, that exist, that have also come together to address health issues. So ASEAN has a uh, Asia Pacific um, uh, strategy for emerging diseases, APSID. Mm -hmm. the, um, there is the IDSR, uh, Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response, for, for Africa, um, which is tied to the IHR. There is the, the Africa CDC, which is a function of the, uh, which is a, a part of the, uh, the AU. Um, we have Mercosur um, in, in the Americas, which is you know, an economic um, company, but has taken on a lot of health issues. So, so uh, on top of the regional offices of the WHO, we have also seen um, these other regional entities that have tried to, to come together to, to deal with preparedness and response. And in some cases, it's very operational. Um, so the Caribbean region, for example, um, they, they actually share laboratory capacity. They, I mean, uh, we've seen we have different, different country blocks in the world that have come together to share capacity around surveillance um, and, and epidemiologic capacity and laboratory capacity um, and information sharing. And in other places, it is much more around a cohesive strategy. So I, um, and I, and I would also note that the, um, not all of the regional offices for WHO are created equal, and some some are very strong. Uh, actually, uh, PAHO, Pan American Health Organization, um, proceed, uh, was the the constitution for that was ratified in 1903, and uh, so it precedes the WHO and it. It is an extraordinarily strong organization. And then we have other parts of the world where the regional offices are not quite as strong, but are have growing voices and, and have kind of varying strengths depending on what the challenges are in those regions. Um, and, and let me actually turn to, to Claire, because because we, we have we've worked in different regions of the world and, and might have more um, more things to say about the regional approaches. No, I mean, I, I agree with everything Rebecca has just said, which is that, you know, there are regional bodies within the World Health Organization. They're very different uh, and there's, there's not a kind of um, template for how they look. Um, but there are, you know, things like APSED, right? So the, the ASEAN, well, that was what the one I was going to pick up, right? You see um, economic blocks developing their own public health mechanisms for reporting diseases, for building capacity. You know, in the EU, we've got the um, ECDC, right? The European Centre for Disease Control, the same in Africa. Um, Latin America, not per se, but, you know, through, through the PAHO mechanism, it's got a strong, strong thing. And I think this also speaks to some of the more recent debates that are happening around the, um, the revisions to the international health regulations. So one of the proposals that was suggested was that um, you know, we should think about tiered systems for notifying diseases, whether that be based on severity, a kind of traffic light system, or whether it should be regional, and then maybe there could be like a regional public health emergency of international concern. Uh, I guess the risk of that is, as we've seen with coronavirus, right? If you call that a regional public health emergency and it would just be an alert in Asia, we would have been even less prepared than we were when it arrived in Europe or in the US or wherever else, you know, the rest of the world has arrived at. And so there's challenges to regional bodies when it comes to infectious disease controls because we don't just travel within regions, right? And therefore, disease is going to spread beyond regions. And so there's some things I think government, there's, there's some things that I think regional bodies can do well, but I don't think we should uh, get rid of the global level and just revert to the regional. Of course, the, the here, the, um... You know, the, uh, if you could, or in other areas of sort of global governance, you have uh, the opposite problem almost that the regional bodies have become too powerful and, and too, um, and, and there's, for example, if you go through the global financial safety net, there is an issue 
whether on the one hand you have the IMF and you have you know, emerging European structure, you have Asian structures, and there's a general concern that you, these are not linked up well enough and there may be cracks in, in the architecture. And, and so it sounds like, like in the health area, there are a lot of variation across regions in, in the exact sort of um, allocation of, of um, responsibility between these different regional offices of the WHO and, 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 and other, other institutions. So I, I think this is uh, very much parallels. I wanted to, there was a, another, someone else from the audience who wanted to come in. So I was going to let uh, Tahid uh, Tehrani, Tehranchi, I don't know if I produce it, if I pronounce it correctly. So can you um, unmute yourself and, and uh, ask your question? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Can you introduce Hello, yourself too? Yeah, sure. First of all, I would like to thank all the panelists for this great discussion. My name is Tohi Tehranchi, and I am a pentalingual economics student, and I'm a Middle Eastern. I live in Iran. Um, well, the question is that um, the importance of health is very better understood when it is something which um, the public generally interacts more with. Um, so, like, there are many millions of travelers every month in the world, like before the pandemic, actually. But there is going to be even post-pandemic. Uh, like, so there are million, millions of travelers in the world. Um, so could there be like mandatory health fees or like a health passport or a, like a certificate which would allow um, travelers to travel and then something which could give more power to the WHO and like it could provide like more uh, fundings for the um, um, like or WHO. So just quickly, I mean, th that mechanism of a health passport or something does exist currently for something like yellow fever, right? You have it to allow you to travel. And that's fine for something which is, um, doesn't affect everyone in the world, right? And it's only, it's spread by vectors. So it's only in particular parts of the world where that exists. So it isn't prohibitive to uh, kind of equity restrictions. The concern about these kind of immunity passports, health passports, and, and um, Rebecca's colleague Alex Phelan has done lots of work on this, is around equity of um, who's going to get them, right? And presumably the people who are going to be traveling are the ones who are going to be richer. They're the ones who are going to be able to afford the, to be able to get this. And does it create perverse incentives around people desperately going to try to get infected? to be able to get this passport, to be able to resume normal life? And what risk does that pose broader in society if you're seeing people actively trying to get infected? Uh, I'm sure Rebecca can jump in. I see her waving her hand. And, and just to say, once again, Guild Coast will take every opportunity we have. We don't know if having been infected actually provides immunity. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, just to say that as often as we possibly can. But yes, please yeah. go ahead. It's, it's a very important statement and, and of course something that it's easy to forget when we, we don't even know whether um, we have immunity, we don't know for how long and for how, you know, if there is some immunity for how, how good it is. So, so to be repeated, uh, I think we are, we are coming to, towards the close of this conversation. Is there anyone who wants to make a final remark of something that has been brought up and, and not fully? Yeah, no, um, I just wanted to, uh, just, you know, that there's been a lot of questions of when our country is going to be willing to relinquish sovereignty for the, the global good. And now are we all being a bunch of hippies saying we need more global coordination uh, when, you know, Donald Trump is in the White House? Does it even make sense to discuss this? So, so maybe to end on a positive note, I mean, I think all of us know that from big unprecedented crisis come big unprecedented changes, some of them very good, right? The UN was created in 1945 and the NHS in 1948. So um, I, I thought uh, the question earlier about, you know, do we think uh, th this is ever going to happen? I just want to point out that amidst all the doom and gloom, we are seeing signs of improved international cooperation in some parts of the world. Obviously, as a European, I've been paying attention to what the EU is doing. And a year ago, the idea that EU member states were going to collectively borrow you know, a huge sum of money um, for the re COVID recovery fund was unthinkable. So I think you know, that's why we are all here spending time discussing 
where next for the WHO is to put new ideas on the table and to bring a little bit of you know new optimistic options uh, despite the political constraints. So I, just, I wanted to make this slightly more optimistic point um, before throwing uh, up. Yeah, I think that is a, 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 a good point to, to end. I, and we have talked about you know, the possibility of, of starting all over and what would it look like if we created something like the WHO again. And I think it does matter a great deal when you do that. And that goes to what you said, Lucy, that you know, there are those moments in, in history where, where there is a genuine sort of understanding for the interconnectedness and for the, the vulnerabilities that we, we create when we fail to, to address these um, uh, global, global issues. And, and uh, you know, even if you know, we were to create something that is very close to, to um, to what the WHO looks like today, I think we have also come up with a number of potential uh, improvements or, or uh, inc more incremental improvements. And, and uh, I think, and, and of course, also the possibility of, of um, bringing in, uh, particularly on the funding side, you know, uh, getting much more uh, of private sector uh, contributions. And of course, in very many of these global challenges, Global challenges. We are um, sorry. That's uh, many global challenges. We are expecting the private sector to come in, and institutional investors. Um, some of that is happening, and and it's happening. Uh, I think increasingly also in this space because I see a lot of signs that private organizations and and uh, also institutional uh, investors are paying attention to this space, and of course. No one can, in after this experience and this uh, life-changing uh, experience for so many of us, um, can predict what what will come out in terms of, of a willingness to fund something like this after after uh, the pandemic is gone. I, at one point, I also think we we need to to make sure that we make in the same spirit of the immunity comment before is that you know for much of the world. And I would say for all of the world, this pandemic is very much still real. And even though if we talk about recovery and, and uh, withdrawing uh, or opening up the economy and so on, we're going to live with this pandemic for a very long time, at least for the next three years, maybe even for five years. And so we need to think about, you know, can we reform these institutions in at a time like this? And probably we will need to because... Uh, uh, we we know that this pandemic will not go away very easily. We we are learning for how for national uh, institutions can respond better, and there will be a lot of uh, investigations, commissions appointed at the national level. I see no reason why we shouldn't try to look at at this um, at at the, the international level. So this discussion today has been a very uh, good beginning of that, or a part of that. Uh, conversation. So thank you very much to all my uh, panelists. Thank you to all the questions from the audience and uh, be safe and have a nice weekend and a nice summer. Thank you very much. Thank you.